Thank <laughs> you. 
The Food and Nutrition Research Institute Sensory Evaluation Laboratory primarily serves the sensory evaluation needs of FNRI in-house researchers. FNRI SEL assists food industries with their product to move up the value chain and attain global competitiveness through research, teaching or training, and consultancy service. The laboratory is designed following ISO requirement for sensory evaluation. It has a preparation room equipped with chiller and food and nutrition research institute, sensory evaluation laboratory, utensils for food preparation and service, a conference room for group discussions, hand washing station, and 10 partitioned evaluation booths with computers, controlled lighting, noise, and temperature. One of FNRI SEL's best assets are the trained and experienced managers, sensory analysts, and sensory panelists. The laboratory employs internationally acceptable and validated test methods and computerized data collection through their customized ESEL software. FNRI SEL offers various services to help food industries with their product development. Consumer acceptability and preference test helps identify which flavor, smell, texture, and appearance is preferred. Descriptive and sensory profiling test includes development of language for product significant attributes and creates its sensory blueprint. Difference test is a procedure used for quality monitoring of in-between batch consistency or changes of product quality through time. Other services Seminars and trainings on sensory evaluation Panelist recruitment and training Consultation on experimental design Computerized data collection. The sensory facilities are used to educate students, entrepreneurs, technical staff of food industries, as well as managers and decision makers on the science of food acceptance. Knowledge on sensory evaluation helps identify which flavors, smell, texture, and appearance deliver to the highest consumer likings. How to avail the services. FNRI SEL plans to extend their sensory evaluation expertise to meet the needs of food-related and consumer products industries. Future endeavors for FNRI SEL, which will ensure consumer perception will be the heart of FNRI food innovation, are the following. Infrastructure development to cater testing for appearance, odor, texture, taste. Development of expert panels. Computerization of data management system with application of sensometrics to extract information from large sensory data and development of staff competency on fields of flavor science, human behavior, and statistics. The final judge of food quality is our customer. Understand customer insights and consider sensory evaluation as a tool to measure customer satisfaction. Thinking quality Thinking Sensory, talk to us.
The FNRI Service Laboratory is an ISO IEC 17025 accredited laboratory which is composed of three laboratories. It is the focal agency of the Department of Science and Technology for Nutrition Labeling and is recognized by the Philippine FDA for Nutrition Labeling and by BFAR for Marine Food Products Analysis. It is the only laboratory in the Philippines that is capable to analyze serum vitamin A and urinary iodine excretion. Initially mandated to conduct researches on biological parameters and support the laboratory needs of various in-house food research and development projects, FNRI SL has continuously expanded and has offered its services also to the public. The chemical laboratory is equipped with instruments that allow proximate determination and physical chemical analysis of foods. Also, our laboratory is equipped with state-of-the-art modern instruments such as high-performance liquid chromatography, gas chromatography, atomic absorption spectrophotometer, graphite furnace equipped AAS, automatic analyzer, WYD iodine checker, and the UVVIS spectrophotometer is currently used for developing methods and water quality assessment. In the biochemical laboratory, other modern instrumentation are being used in order to support the National Nutrition Survey, medical research institutions, LGUs, non-government and international organizations. Having continuously participated and showed satisfactory results in the quality assurance programs, of the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Biochem Lab offers now wide range of tests. Meanwhile, the Microbiological Lab is a food laboratory offering range of tests covering spoilage, indicator and pathogenic microorganisms in food and water samples. The Microlab offers the following. Also, the Microlab conducts isolation and identification of pathogenic microorganisms in food that are of significance to public health. Recently, the laboratory has also started performing molecular pathogen detection in food and bacterial cultures using the technology of real-time polymerase chain reaction, detection of salmonella and vibrio, has become more rapid and accurate as we are committed to deliver high quality and timely services. The laboratory is maintained by well-trained, experienced, and PRC-registered chemists and chemical technicians, medical technologists, and registered microbiologists on analysis of different samples. Aside from our commitment, to maintain quality data generation, FNRI SL also holds trainings and continuous consultation to customers and stakeholders. In the future, the laboratory aims to expand its services by offering specialized tests to the public. In order to do this, we commit to continuously develop methods and train our laboratory staff for excellence and quality service. First and stakeholders. In the future, the laboratory aims to expand its services.
In the food industry, ensuring the quality and safety of consumer products is always the priority. To meet this need, food manufacturers frequently rely on food testing laboratories to determine the nutritional content of food products and to examine its possible microbial and chemical contaminants to comply with regulatory requirements. Philippine regulatory bodies take the lead in ensuring that local laboratories have the capability to generate internationally acceptable analytical data. One of their bases in evaluating the competence of laboratory is the result of their continuous participation in proficiency testing scheme. Proficiency testing is an effective tool to determine the performance of a laboratory through an inter-laboratory comparison. DOST FNRI, through its proficiency testing laboratory, provides affordable, accessible, and reliable PT programs to support testing laboratories in their ISO 17025 accreditation. From 2006 to date, PT rounds were organized based on international standard, which includes PT on physical chemical analysis on different food matrices. These FNRI PT rounds were participated in by 20 to 70 local and foreign laboratories. Seminars, trainings, or workshops are also organized after every PT round where participating laboratories are provided with knowledge that may possibly help them to improve their laboratory performance. Currently, the Proficiency Testing Laboratory of the DOST FNRI is the only ISO IEC 17043-2010 accredited proficiency testing provider in the Philippines and is able to sustain and continuously expand its accreditation for eight years. Aside from providing PT schemes, the laboratory also offers reference materials generated from PT rounds which can be used for quality assurance purposes. Announcements on how to participate in the FNRI PT rounds, results of the current PT round, available reference material of the FNRI PTL, and their future plans are all made available in the IFNRI website. In 2010, DOSD FNRI revolutionized its take on nutrition by incorporating genomics in its researches. Investigating the relationship of anthropometric, biochemical, clinical, dietary, and health components to the genetic makeup of Filipinos, DOSD FNRI is looking into providing a more personalized approach of achieving optimum nutrition to every Filipino. Through nutritional genomics, we attempt to better understand how a single nucleotide, a single letter, can make a big difference in our way of living. And so, to support this endeavor, DOSD and I capitalize on establishing its molecular laboratory known as the Nutritional Genomics, or the New Gen Lab. With its thrust of bringing science to the people, the New Gen Lab provides assessment of genes and genetic variants associated with micronutrient deficiencies and diet-related non-communicable diseases. The New Gen Lab is equipped with some of the state-of-the-art equipment in molecular biology, such as the automated nucleic acid extraction machine, bioinformatics, real-time and digital PCR systems, automated liquid handling system, microvolume spectrophotometer system, and gel documentation system.
complete workflow adhering to the highest standard of competency in laboratory testing, Nugen Lab is setting the mark in providing mole biotechniques with transparency, validity, and reliability. Whether you are an individual or a group of enthusiasts seeking answers in nutritional genomics, the Nugen Lab awaits you. Our proficient personal works in close contact with our customers through customized analysis, provision of technical consultancy in nutritional genomics, and standardization of laboratory competency. We can serve you better. We are partnering with a leader in genomic testing for a higher throughput and faster turnaround time. Pagamitadawan <laughs> Open the light, Ate. Open the light. Food and Nutrition Research Institute's Sensory mm. Evaluation Laboratory primarily serves the sensory evaluation needs of FNRI in house researchers. FNRI SEL assists food industries with their product to move up the value chain and attain global competitiveness no! through research, teaching, and training, and consultancy service. The laboratory is designed following ISO requirement for sensory evaluation. It has a preparation room equipped with chiller and freezer, microwave oven, cooking range, utensils for food preparation and service, a conference room for group discussions, hand washing station, and 10 partitioned evaluation booths with computers, controlled lighting, noise, and temperature. One of FNRI SEL's best assets are the trained and experienced managers, sensory analysts, and sensory panelists. The laboratory employs internationally acceptable and validated test methods and computerized data collection through their customized ESEL software. FNRI SEL offers various services to help food industries with their product development. Consumer acceptability and preference test helps identify which flavor, smell, texture, and appearance is preferred. Descriptive and sensory profiling test includes development of language for product significant attributes and creates a sensory blueprint. Difference test is a procedure used for quality monitoring of in-between batch consistency or changes of product quality through time. Other services, seminars and trainings on sensory evaluation, panelist recruitment and training, consultation on experimental design, computerized data collection. The sensory facilities are used to educate students, entrepreneurs, technical staff of food industries, as well as managers and decision makers on the science of food acceptance. Knowledge and sensory evaluation helps identify which flavors, smell, texture, and appearance delivered to the highest consumer likings. How to avail the services? FNRI SEL plans to extend their sensory evaluation expertise to meet the needs of food-related and consumer products industries. Future endeavors for FNRI SEL, which will ensure consumer perception will be the heart of FNRI food innovation, are the following. Infrastructure development to cater testing for appearance, odor, texture, taste. Development of expert panels, Computerization of data management system with application of sensometrics to extract information from large sensory data and development of staff competency on fields of flavor science, human behavior, and statistics. 
The final judge of food quality is our customer. Understand customer insights and consider sensory evaluation as a tool to measure customer satisfaction. Thinking quality? Thinking sensory? Talk to us! Good day, everyone. It's good morning using the Central European time and good afternoon using the Philippine Standard Time. But wherever you are right now, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to the Omixena Lecture Series. I am Beng Aguila and I will be your moderator for today's lecture. Please stay put as we offer a word of thanks to the Almighty through this AVP. Good day, everyone. It's good morning using the Central European time and good afternoon using the Philippine standard. Stars go out each night. 
Thank you, Leah and Albert. Beautiful voices and great talent from FNRI. Apologies for the glitches. The Omic Sena staging a scene in the Omics is a platform to communicate the recent advances in genomics research at the DOST FNRI. A new twist to the three o'clock habit, the participants of the webinar series will spend nine afternoons with lectures and workshops from Dr. Gonzalez himself and other omics experts from select areas of the European Union and United Kingdom. To wish success in the opening of the... USC Secretary Fortunato de la Peña. DOST Undersecretary for Research and Development, Dr. Rowena Cristina Guevara, Dr. Brian Gonzalez, our Balik Scientist for Metabolomics, colleagues, and to all participants who are joining us via Zoom and in our official YouTube channel, a pleasant afternoon to all. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the opening of the Omexena Lecture Series. Some of you might have attended first Omexena last month. That was an information field premiere of the Omexena platform where DOST FNI featured the frequently asked questions on nutrigenomics. For the second time, DOST FNI brings you Omexena with a bolder move to bring together omics experts from way beyond the Philippine borders. The Philippines continues to, be, to build strong innovative foundations and learning and reflecting from the global scene is the very way to go. As such, we are thrilled to bring you the nine-day Omexena lecture series. For nine afternoons, we are expecting to learn the best of comics technologies and how these emerging platforms can enhance nutrition and food research that will eventually be translated for societal benefits of our country. Beyond basics, hopes are high that we can also build networks and collaborative paths, all towards building an omic-driven, innovative Philippines. Uh, William Wordsworth said that life is divided into three terms, that which was, which is, 
and which will be. So let us learn from the past to, the, to profit by the present and from the present to live better in the future. I hope that through all the topics to be discussed from this day until October 7, we can learn how to create a better future in life and nutrition through the studies of omic sciences. To all the participants, again, my warmest welcome and lend us your active participation because we have inspiring lecture series ahead. So thank you so much and stay tuned. Maraming maraming salamat po at magandang araw mo. Thank you, Dr. Adepa. For our welcome message, a virtual round of applause to our Undersecretary for R&D. Please welcome Engineer Rowena Cristina L. Guevara. USD Secretary Fortunato T. De La Pena, USD FNRI Director Dr. Imelda Angeles Agdepa, our DOST Balik Scientist Dr. Gerald Brian Gonzalez, colleagues, fellow advocates, and champions of health and nutrition, and our media partners. Welcome to the Omic Sena Lecture Series. Magandang agham po sa ating lahat. Omic Sena was coined by DOSCF and RI to create a scene in a good way. It seems that it will continue to serve as a platform for the DOSCF and RI to keep us in the loop on its undertaking in genomics. With Dr. Brian Gonzalez on board, the second Omic Sena for 2021 collaborates with the DOSC's Balik Scientist Program to drumbeat the advent of another set of omic science at the Institute, the Metabolomics. This expansion in the R&D platform will guide DOSCF and RI in setting up more actionable strategies in the molecular food and nutrition arena. I am optimistic that the series will provide new learnings to bring stronger and bolder omics-based research and development initiatives, not only in DOSCF and RI, but in the entire country, as I understand that this omic Sena is well represented by genomics enthusiasts Mula Luzon, Sayas, and Mindanao. As we come together for the next nine afternoons, I hope that we will be able to lay out plans and strategies towards the creation of new intervention systems, biomarker discovery, and innovative health and nutrition platforms through the use of omics technology. May this event sharpen our vision to acquire the lens of seeing through what our country needs to reach zero hunger and optimum health and nutrition at the molecular level. Congratulations to the organizing committee of the Omic Sena Lecture Series and to all the staff of DOSTF and RI, led by Dr. Imelda Angeles Agdepa. Magandang agham sa ating lahat. Thank you so much, uh, Yusek Guevara. Now for our inspirational message, let's hear from the Secretary of the DOST. Please welcome Secretary Fortunato T. De La Peña. DOST Undersecretary for R&D, Dr. Rowena Cristina Guevara. Food and Station Research Institute Director and Scientist, Dr. Imelda Angeles Agdepa. Food and Nutrition Research Institute Deputy Director, Dr. Anthony Calibo. Our Balik Scientist for Metabolomics, Dr. Brian Gonzalez. To all our esteemed speakers, colleagues, fellow advocates, and champions of health and nutrition, 
and to everyone joining us via Zoom and DOST FNRI's YouTube channel, a pleasant day to all. The Nutritional Genomics Program of the DOST Food and Nutrition Research Institute is part of the DOST's Big 21 in 2021. This achievement highlights the growing field of nutritional genomics and the DOST FNRI's New Gen Laboratory, now an ISO 17025 Certified Molecular Laboratory. Beyond this recognition, I am more thrilled to see what our R&D program and the scientific and technological services in nutritional genomics can offer to ensure optimum nutrition for everyone. Earlier this year, the first Omic Sena answered frequently asked questions on the genomics. The first installment of this web-based learning platform of DOST FNRI's genomics programs made us realize that nutritional genomics can scale up nutrition and health sciences. Studying our genes through the omics platforms can bring about enhanced nutrition recommendations and perhaps nutrition and health policies in the long run. Its eventual integration in clinical practice can boost our efforts to overcome malnutrition and help us achieve our goals of good health and well-being. As DOST continues to expand the country's omics footprint, this second offering of omics Sena with Dr. Brian Gonzalez, our Balik Scientist for Metabolomics, is anticipated to bring new frontiers in omics-based innovations. This will fine-tune our efforts to use various molecular platforms to pacify and eventually end our long-standing battle against malnutrition and non-communicable diseases. Now, with the generous sharing of information and practices from our keynote speakers ahead of us, I invite you all to join me in getting a detailed glance at omics technologies and how they can play critical roles in nutrition and health. May this deep appreciation of omics technologies guide us in pushing for more innovations directed to our local needs. I am optimistic that this lecture series will also strengthen the competencies of our researchers in initiating omics-based research and development. One thing that the ongoing pandemic has taught us is to hold tight to what science and technology can do. Science and technology will always be an important key in solving various societal problems. Na paghahandaan man o hindi, katulad nitong pandemia, innovations and discoveries will help us thrive and become resilient. On behalf of the Department of Science and Technology, I would like to thank our speakers from different parts of the European Union and the United Kingdom for their time and expertise. I extend my appreciation, especially to our DOST Balik scientist, Dr. Gerard Brian L. Gonzalez, for bringing this exciting series to light, together with the DOST Food and Nutrition Research Institute. Thank you all for being here. Let us have a learning field week ahead. Mabuhay! Thank you, Secretary De La Peña. Maraming salamat po uh, for your untiring support to all the programs and projects of FNRI. At this point, sabi nila, the world is full of diamonds and gems, and we are having one of them today. To formally introduce our expert, may I call on the mother of the Nutrition and Food R&D Division, the Chief Science Research Specialist. Please welcome Engineer Rosemary Garcia. Thank you very much, Ms. Bang. I am privileged and honored today to be given the task of introducing the first speaker for our Omixena Lecture Series. Our speaker is a food technologist and a product of the University of the Philippines, Mindanao. 
He took a double degree of MS, Food Science and Technology, and MS, Food Products of Animal Origin, at the University of Copenhagen, Denmark, and Universitat Autónoma de Barcelona in Spain. Then, he obtained his PhD, Applied Biological Sciences, Chemistry and Bioprocess Technology at Ghent University, Belgium. Our speaker specialized in metabolomics and food science and technology. And as a food scientist, he used his skills and expertise in food and nutritional chemistry, specifically mass spectrometry-based analysis, to study severe acute malnutrition in children molecular perspective. Don't you find that too irresistibly interesting? I do. Currently, an assistant professor at Pagineggen University and Research, the Netherlands, he has collaborated with various institutions and hospitals, such as the Institute for Metabolic Science in the University of Cambridge, the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, Canada, Kenya Medical Research Institute, and the World Health Organization, European Regional Office under the Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Obesity Unit in Copenhagen, Denmark. A research foundation Flanders postdoctorate fellow at Ghent University, Kira Third, in the panel for gastroenterology, hepatology, endocrinology, metabolism, and nutrition. If he looks familiar to some of you, it is because fresh from college, he worked at the Department of Science and Technology, Special Projects Division, way back in 2009 as project coordinator for national R&D initiatives in health and agriculture. And how far has he gone 12 years after? You will have an idea after his talk. So guests, colleagues, and our online participants for the opening of our Omixena lecture series to introduce to us what nutritional metabolomics is all about Put your hands together and give him a virtual clap as we welcome our DOST Balik scientist, another pride of the Philippines, Dr. Gerard Brian Gonzalez. Dr. Brian, the virtual floor is yours. <clears throat> oh, hello, good morning. Thank you very much. Thank you to FNRI for the kind introduction. Um, I'd like to share my screen now, which I cannot do. Um, all right. So yeah, um, magandang hapon po sa lahat. Uh, good morning here from the Netherlands. I am Brian, um, and today it's day one of our webinar series, and I, I encourage you to stay on for the next two weeks as I've invited some of my friends to give um, some introduction about nutritional metabolomics uh, for, for FNRI and, of course, for all the participants. Again, thank you very much to FNRI for this kind invitation. Um, before I, I proceed, I'd just like to introduce where I am right now. Um, <clears throat> I'm in the Netherlands uh, in a city called Wageningen. <clears throat> Sorry. And yeah, Wageningen is there somewhere um, in the east side of Amsterdam, around two hours away. And in that small town of Wageningen, you will find uh, the beautiful campus of Wageningen University and Research. And I'm not sure maybe many of you are not familiar of uh, Wageningen University and also part of my promotional activities for our university. I'm just, uh, yeah, so here are some fun facts about our university. Um, yeah, this is where my building is as of the moment. Uh, Wageningen University is a medium-sized to large-sized university in the Netherlands. We have around 13,000 students and it prides itself as being always ranked first in the field of agricultural sciences in all major rankings in the world. 
Um, I work at the Division of Human Nutrition and Health, uh, specifically the group of uh, nutrition, metabolism, and genomics, and uh, where we specialize in uh, omics technologies for understanding nutrition-related uh, research. So I guess, yeah, you can visit our website if you want to know more about Wageningen University and all opportunities that we offer, uh, including scholarships for PhD students, or you can also send me an email uh, later on. I was informed, unfortunately, that there might be a power interruption in Manila uh, in around 15 minutes, so I will have to skip through some slides. Um, no worry, this is just the introductory, uh, introductory uh, lecture, and in the next days, hopefully, if the electricity is more stable, then we will have a more in-depth um, discussion. So today, I'd just like to introduce the concept of nutritional metabolomics. And uh, yeah, so uh, nutritional metabolomics is part of the systems biology uh, field, which um, indicates that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So systems biology is the study whereby we uh, integrate biology and computational, um, um, computational tools and chemistry uh, to understand the complex interactions within biological systems. And for us to study systems biology, we use uh, omics technologies. And there are several omics technologies, and that's where we uh, are right now. So metabolomics specifically is part of the omics cascade. Um, it, it goes way downstream um, of this cascade, whereby we are more familiar with genomics. And I, I believe that FNRI is very strong in this field already. But the DNA can only tell us what is uh, what is possible or what can happen. So you can have a gene for obesity and doesn't mean you will be obese, but it just gives you the, the higher risk for developing it. Transcriptomics is um, what appears to be happening um, in, in, in the body as these are the, the genes that are expressed. And when you express these genes, proteins get produced and the proteins and the study of proteins <clears throat> tells you what makes this happen. And you, you will understand that later on. The metabolites, on the other hand, as I mentioned, they are more downstream, meaning that they are telling you what is actually happening or what just happened. And this is because metabolites are, are end products of, <clears throat> of, of these proteins and mRNA and, and DNA. So metabolomics being towards the end of the metabolic cascade is, of course, a, a very downstream uh, type of omics. But if we are to understand metabolomics, we have to uh, go down, we have to go through all these terms. So what is a metabolite, metabolism, and a metabolome before we could understand metabolomics. So let's go through all of that. A metabolite is a small molecule. So anything that is smaller than 1,500 Daltons is considered a metabolite. And these are either an organic or an inorganic. So inorganic meaning that it, it could have some metals in it. But um, the, the most common things that we know that are metabolites are caffeine. By the way, can I please request people to unmute themselves? I'm hearing. Okay, thank you. Um, Yes, so uh, things like amino acid, like leucine or uh, quercetin, which is a fla flavonoid found in plants, and they are either building blocks of larger molecules or they are the, the end products of metabolism. And they are either primary or secondary metabolites, and primary metabolites being those that are participating in energy metabolism, whereas secondary metabolites have other functions apart from um, energy metabolism, uh, energy production. <clears throat> metabolism, on the other hand, is the interaction between these metabolites and enzymes. So this is the most popular metabolic pathway, I think. And uh, this is the TCA cycle. Um, and metabolism is either the synthesis or the, uh, or, or the, the breakdown of, of molecules. So you have catabolism or anabolism, and that's metabolism. The metabolome then is when you have a complete set of these metabolites that are forming the, the different pathways. Um, so when we study the metabolome, which is again, the complete set of metabolites within a cell, a tissue or a biological sample at a given time. <clears throat> um, and it's very important for us to understand that metabolome is a very time specific uh, analysis. Unlike the genome, it doesn't really change as you age 
but the metabolome changes very fast. As I'm talking to you, my metabolome is changing. So it, it's very um, important for us to understand that this is a very time-sensitive analysis. Um, so when you study the metabolome, that is what you call metabolomics. <clears throat> um, so metabolomics, as I said, is the integration of biology. Uh, so when you have uh, blood samples or cells or urine samples, and we integrate that with analytical chemistry, this is a, a mass spectrometer, um, and we will have a lecture on mass spectrometry uh, towards the end of the week. Um, we will integrate that with bioinformatics and we use bioinformatics to make sense of the, the mass spec data. And with all that combined, we can then get a good glimpse of our metabolism in that particular time point. Metabolomics has two workflows. Um, we can either work on an untargeted basis or a targeted basis whereby in an untargeted setting, this is what we call a discovery phase. So we don't really know what we're looking for. We just inject a sample in either an NMR or a mass spec. Um, and then um, we let the machine tell us what it sees. Uh, the, the big uh, downside to untargeted metabolism, uh, targeted metabolomics, sorry, is uh, you need to uh, be able to have a confident metabolite annotation or metabolite identification towards the end. So because we don't really know what we're looking for, we rely on the mass spec to tell us what these uh, features are. And that being said, the last step, no, actually it's not the last step, but a very important step in untargeted metabolomics is, is identifying these biomarkers. Whereas if you have a targeted metabolomics, um, we usually have a set of specified metabolites that we want to analyze and that makes it a semi-quantitative or a quantitative analysis, but makes it easier because you already know what you're looking for. Uh, that being said, there are downsides and high sides to um, choosing either you want to do a targeted metabolomics and a non-targeted metabolomics approach. The more targeted you become, the more stable and repeatable your analysis is and the, more, the higher the quantitative accuracy is. <clears throat> Whereas the, the more untargeted you become, then the complexity of the data increases, um, the repeatability decreases, but of course the amount of information you get from a metabolomics analysis also increases very, uh, very much. Um, but of course, if given this, that you, you have a very low repeatability and very high variability, it's very important that if you do a non-targeted approach that you validate that with a more targeted approach. By the way, again, I'm going quite fast because, yeah, this lecture might be cut off um, later on, but don't fret because towards the end of the, uh, starting tomorrow and until next week, we will have a more in-depth discussion about all these. So just write down your keywords and then uh, we will have a deeper discussion uh, beginning tomorrow. Uh, or if the electricity doesn't come off, then... Um, by the way, not here in Manila. I mean, uh, we, we, we have news that this might happen in Manila. All right, so this is the typical metabolomics, um, uh, how do you call that, uh, platform where we have a sample preparation. So I, this could either be your cells or your blood samples or urine samples, fecal samples. And then we have uh, analysis uh, using mass spectrometry or NMR, and we use bioinformatics and by statistics to analyze the data. And from there, you validate your experiment and you design another experiment again to validate your findings. That being said, I would like to emphasize that metabolomics is not a one person show. This means that, um, this means that, uh, that uh, many different people uh, are supposed to be working together. And I, I hope we all take this opportunity to get to learn each other and, and, and try to see who can collaborate with, with who, because it, it's a huge undertaking. Um, not one lab usually does all of these things. So, um, so what they're calling Yes. Okay, so um, again, we have two separate days uh, discussing about how to analyze uh, metabolomics. Um, so, but the first 
uh, most, I think most popular technique for metabolomics analysis is mass spectrometry. Uh, the good thing about it is it's rather sensitive and, and you, you, you detect more metabolites because it's very sensitive. But of course, you face difficulties in quantification and structural elucidation, and it is destructive to your samples. Whereas another uh, type of metabolomics instrumentation is called nuclear magnetic resonance. And I'm expecting a very good lecture uh, on NMR uh, by Professor John Swan. Uh, it, it's a non-destructive sample, uh, sample handling. It's easier to quantify it. It's very robust. The problem is it's less sensitive. So you only really see the, the high abundant uh, metabolites when you use NMR um, compared to uh, mass spectrometer. Um, again, in the next days, we will have a deeper uh, discussion about this. So how do we apply metabolomics in nutrition research? So uh, this is a, a figure from the European Respiratory Journal, which just tells us what factors influence the metabolites in the body. So we have genetic factors. These are intrinsic or internal exposures. You have your own immune system. You have the, the, the fluids uh, that you have in your body, but also we are exposed to external um, stimuli. We have pathogens and drugs. We have lifestyle, whether you smoke or you drink, that changes your metabolome, whether you're allergic, um, and also the time of the day or the season. And of course, the biggest influence I would say in nutritional metabolome is the nutrition. So your diet changes your, your um, metabolome. Um, there are two uh, applications I'd like to just give very briefly um, right now, and that's on biomarker discovery or when you want to understand molecular mechanism of outcome or a certain phenotype. So, uh, Tomorrow, I, I'm expecting a, 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 a lecture from um, uh, Lars Draxted about biomarker classification. So he's one of the pioneers of this. Um, and, and there are different kinds of biomarkers. And, and this is a definition of these kinds of biomarkers. By the way, if you want a copy of these slides, uh, just send me an email or I will give it to FNRI and you can get it from FNRI. Um, but there are three major types of biomarkers where metabolomics can be very helpful with. And number one is intake or exposure biomarkers. Uh, the if, number two, effect or response biomarkers. Number three is susceptible, a susceptibility or host factor biomarkers. So what are intake and exposure biomarkers? These are biomarkers that reflect the extrinsic factors that the humans are exposed to, like the diet or food compounds. And these are eight validity criteria, uh, Lars Drakstedt will be our speaker tomorrow, um, <clears throat> on how you validate what is a real biomarker. And for example, one use of biomarkers is that it can provide a better dietary assessment than food frequency questionnaires, because uh, we have experienced time and time and again that when you ask people, oh, did you smoke, for example, people tend to deny it and people tend to lie on their questionnaires. But if we if we have a biomarker of that in urine, for example, then we know for sure whether this person was exposed to certain exposures. Um, and and you know, your, your biological sample, your blood and your urine, it doesn't lie if you analyze it uh, very well. So we can use intake and exposure biomarkers to assess compliance to dietary intervention. So for example, if you are a type two diabetes patient and you've been given um, a certain type of diet, um, we can use uh, metabolomics to determine whether you have been compliant to that uh, dietary intervention. And these are examples uh, from Lars' group. Uh, as I said, he's one of the pioneers for, for this kind of research, and we will have him tomorrow. Um, we, ha ha we have now uh, methods to detect whether you've been eating seaweeds or you've been eating cereals or, or you've been eating nuts and vegetables and apples and pears and citrus for example. Um, so the, this is one example of a food intake biomarker. Another type of biomarker is called effects or response. And this is a very interesting type of analysis in metabol uh, metabolomics. And one of the applications is what we call metabotyping. Uh, metabotyping is very much um, uh, useful when you want to do personalized nutrition or personalized medicine. Metabotyping basically is based on the metabolites or metabolome, 
we want to classify the population on who reacts with what, uh, or, or again, with personalized nutrition, we all understand that we do not respond to the same uh, triggers in the same way. So using metabolomics, we can actually see, okay, this population here is metabotype A, this is metabotype B and metabotype C. And if you give them, let's say sugar, then um, these three populations will respond differently. A very good example is on urolithins. So um, this is a, a study on pomegranate and pomegranate is a very healthy. I don't know if we have pomegranate in the Philippines, actually, maybe, maybe not, but in, in Spain, it's, they, they have a lot of pomegranate and it's been known to reduce uh, blood lipids and improve uh, cardiovascular health. <clears throat> but um, the, 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 the researchers in Spain found out that uh, not everyone responds to pomegranate intake uh, in the same way. And so there are different metabotypes, for example, metabotype A, where you give them pomegranates and the pomegranate will not affect them. Whereas a metabotype B, if you give them pomegranate, then they would have an improved uh, blood lipid profile. So it would be very important for us to know which, which um, people in the population respond to a certain dietary intervention. And we can use metabolomics for that. And I'm, I'm hoping we will have examples on, on that in the next two weeks, and we can have uh, more discussions on that. Um, so that's, yeah, effect and response biomarkers. <clears throat> the last type of biomarker I'd like to um, discuss is the susceptibility and host factor biomarkers. Also, so we, we do have promigranates in the Philippines. Yeah. By the way, I, I, I will not be able to see the chat very well. So if someone has a question in the chat, I, I just ask the moderator to shout it out for me, please. Yeah, so um, susceptibility or host fa uh, factor biomarkers. Um, these are biomarkers that can predict disease or risk of disease. So this is, um, <clears throat> for example, a paper on um, prediction of um, uh, onset of type 2 diabetes, and it, it's a known fact that branch chain amino acids, for example, are associated with increased risk of um, type 2 diabetes. And we can also do that. So if we have a population uh, where we perform a metabolomics, we can create some predictive models to see which ones in the population are at higher risk of developing a certain disease or which ones have the disease already. And this is a very recent paper from a Claudia Langenberg group at, in Cambridge where they profiled more than 1,000 people, 11,000 people, um, and, and they followed these people up and they were able to see which metabolites are predictive of different kinds of non-communicable diseases. So it, it's very interesting. So <clears throat> if we, for example, have a national nutrition survey, we can make use of metabolomics to look for these uh, biomarkers that are more specific to the Filipino population. And, and we can hopefully publish in Nature Medicine. Let's see. Uh, but yeah, so th this is another um, example of the use of metabolomics, which we will have further discussions on in the next two weeks. This is as an example of my own research. So I, I study malnutrition in children and children who are exposed to malnutrition, they tend to have higher risk of developing non-communicable diseases when they grow old. And we don't really know why. And using metabolomics, um, we, we determined that lean mass is affected by, by, by pl plasma levels of tryptophan. And, uh, <clears throat> and, and a lean mass, of course, is associated with developing non-cardiovascular diseases. So this provides us uh, an interesting pathway to intervene. Uh, if, if you've been in, exposed to early life undernutrition, then we might have to look at your intake of amino acids. Uh, for, for us to alleviate your, uh, your risk for developing cardiovascular uh, diseases in the future. This is a study we performed in Malawi, and we did the same study in Jamaica, and we also found the same thing. The branch chain amino acids and, and the tryptophan pathway are all associated with increased risk of developing non-cardiovascular disease, uh, non-communicable diseases uh, in adults who experienced early life malnutrition. So if we really want to do <clears throat> nutri metabolomics and make use of all these markers, it's very important for us to have a good study design. And there are several types of study designs. It can be an observational cohort, 
uh, ob observational study. Um, for example, if you have a, a big cross-sectional uh, study already uh, where, where you collected a lot of uh, biological material from different types of people, we can do metabolomics on that, or we can have an intervention where, <clears throat> where um, we give a group of people a certain, let's say, pomegranate and the other one without pomegranate, and then we can uh, determine which ones respond or, or not. Um, in the interest of time, we will not go through in depth about the different study designs, but um, we will try to squeeze this in in the next two weeks so that we can have a, a more fruitful discussion. Um, but again, it's very important that we loop it in. We have to understand all these omics technologies are hypothesis generating. So you don't perform uh, you don't perform metabolomics to prove a point. Usually you use metabolomics to generate new knowledge. So it's very important for us to perform metabolomics and then validate that, maybe with an orthogonal biological analysis or in a different population. And then based on that, we, we look for what mechanisms are involved and then we validate these mechanisms. Um, so it's, it's a loop kind of analysis. Um, so this is uh, how we designed as well our, our webinar series. And I'm almost towards the end uh, of my talk. So again, um, we, I have gathered my friends in the field and collaborators, and uh, we are very fortunate to have them on board. Uh, these are really top of the line researchers. Tomorrow we will have Professor Lars Dragsted from Copenhagen University, who will be talking to us about the dietary biomarkers that I just presented to you. Um, hopefully we will have more in depth. And I see that everyone is still here. So it means the electricity didn't cut off, correct? Is everyone still here? Yes, Dr. Brian. Yes, perfect. Okay. So it was just a scare. <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, then uh, on Wednesday, uh, we will have uh, Gerdana, who will be speaking to us about uh, infections and malnutrition and how that affects metabolic profile. But in all of these lectures, there is a big focus on the methods and how they, they, they analyze the data as well. Um, <clears throat> on Thursday, we will have uh, uh, Albert Coleman from the University of Cambridge. He's actually my supervisor when I was in Cambridge, and he is the head of the lipidomics and metabolomics core facility of the University of Cambridge, and he will be discussing to us how to run a core facility. Mm -hmm. um, and then on Friday, we have Laura, a good friend of mine, who will be discussing about plant metabolomics uh, and environmental st stressors. Now, uh, this is a plant metabolomic analysis, but the point here is she will be doing a case by a, a case study where we do step by step, uh, uh, where we take metabolomics step by step, and she will show you how to analyze uh, metabolome. But of course, she will be presenting something about plants, but we could, you know, extrapolate that to marine or, or whatever. Next week, Monday, we will have a very interesting discussion with uh, Justin um, about using metabolome networks um, uh, and, and untargeted metabolomics and really high level data analysis stuff. And, and I'm quite sure Justin is the expert of that. So um, that's a privilege for us, in fact, to have him on board. Uh, next week, Tuesday, again, we will have a very good speaker. This is uh, John Swan, a collaborator of mine, uh, where he will be discussing about NMR spectroscopy based analysis on early life nutrition. Um, then Wednesday, we have Professor Lynn Van Hacke, who will be discussing about the gut microbiome diet axis using metabolomics. And she's also an expert on this. And lastly, on Thursday next week, we will have a very interesting discussion on combining metabolomics and DNA. So how to analyze things that attach to your DNA and affect your genes. And that will be with uh, Lizelot. Um, so with that, I close my presentation and I, um, I welcome any questions by email or by Twitter. Um, and as I said, I'm sorry if I went through this presentation quite quick, uh, but don't worry in the next two weeks, we will have an in-depth presentation on all these aspects. It was just an introduction for today. 
Um, so with that, if we have time, I'm open to questions and comments. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Brian, for presenting nutritional metabolomics in a very layman's term somehow. I think I was advised that we can still accommodate one to two questions while we still have the electricity on. I can see two questions from our audience. Um, the first one came from Jonathan Barcelo. And he said, I am wondering, uh, but end outcomes in health are also related to behavior, right? I am wondering how metabolomics can be streamed blind into policy development, considering the social demographic profile and health policies we currently have. For example, smoking is associated with a lot of health effects, but a lot of people smoke anyway. That's the first this question, a, though. This is, a, this is a, a, a very overarching question, I would say. Um, you know, our job as scientists is to provide the data. Um, we, we've seen that during the COVID uh, response worldwide, you know, uh, yeah, we provide the data. We, we, show, we show policymakers what is, uh, you know, with the best scientific process we, we, we make is, is the correct or the truth, you know, quote unquote. Uh, how that is uh, translated to policy is, of course, uh, a lot of different layers to it. Um, we know that smoking is associated with health effects, of course. Uh, if people choose to smoke, then yeah, the, the only thing we can do as scientists is to advise them. So I don't know if I'm answering the question very well, but this is a, this is a rather multi-layered question. So I, um, yeah, hey, you can send me an email and we can have a long discussion over this off the record. <laughs> thank you, Doc Brian. Another question from Marian Abelia. Can you explain further what do you mean by non-targeted metabolomic method and targeted <clears throat> metabolomic method. All right. Thank you very much for this uh, very specific question. So, um, so there are two kinds of metabolomics, as I said, uh, whether you do an untargeted metabolomics. Usually the, the main difference for this is the type of instrument that we use. So if you have a, a high resolution mass spectrometer, for example, or an NMR, then we do that's when we do a non-targeted analysis. So it's able to do that because uh, the machines are so sensitive and very high mass accurate that you can inject a sample and then the sample, uh, I mean, the, the machine will be able to tell us what are in the sample. Um, that being said, we don't need to know, we don't need to have a prior hypothesis um, before we do the metabolomics analysis. Uh, a targeted metabolomics analysis, on the other hand, is when you have a list of metabolites already that you want to use uh, or you want to find out in, in your sample. So if you say, okay, I have a list here of 500 metabolites and I want to find them in my sample. So I have amino acids, bile acids, uh, organic acids, these kinds of things. Then that's when you do a targeted metabolomics. So targeted metabolomics can be done on a high resolution mass spec, but it can also be done in a low resolution mass spec. So if you have a triple quad machine, for example, you can do a targeted metabolomics approach. Um, tomorrow, no, <clears throat> on Wednesday, uh, Gordana will be presenting more targeted approaches, uh, whereas the other speakers will be presenting more untargeted or non-targeted approaches. So if you stay tuned for all the webinars, we, you will be able to have a, a, a clearer view of what untargeted versus targeted analysis is. Thank you, Doc uh, Brian. Another question from Jason Alcano. Uh, he said, is there a difference between metabolomics and metabonomics? So this is a big discussion in the field. In fact, uh, the, an the short answer is no. The long answer is yes. <laughs> but um, yeah, the, the, the people who, yeah, there's a, a school of different schools of thought, of course. Um, there are pioneers in the field who, want, who, who called it metabonomics. And, and there are, most people call it metabolomics, but um, there are very fine line differences that people just don't, don't, yeah, we, we just ignore the differences on this. Uh, so the short answer is no. Okay, thank you, Doc. 
And another, since we still have uh, electricity in Manila, I think we can still accommodate some of the questions thrown by our audience. The next question came from, came from uh, a former FNRI staff who is now uh, completing her studies in Taiwan uh, from Vanessa J. Timoteo. Thank you for the wonderful talk, Dr. Brian. I wonder how crucial is the quality control part in metabolomics research? How do we avoid false discoveries? Well, um, we avoid false discovery. It, there is always false discovery. Um, there's always a risk for false discovery. And, and in, in the data analysis, we do that by uh, applying statistical um, First of all, the proper statistical tools. Uh, we avoid false discoveries by designing uh, the experiment very well um, and also making sure that we validate the experiment. So, you know, false discovery will always be there, but we can minimize it. You know, we don't avoid it completely. We can only minimize it. So again, we minimize it by having a good study design. So uh, I mentioned a while ago, whether you make a case control study or a longitudinal study or an intervention study. Um, number two, when you have a good study design, you make sure that you apply the correct statistical analysis for the design at hand. So, you know, do you do a logistic regression? Do you do a latent class modeling, or do you do a, you know, network-based analysis? So if you do all that, or do you do false discovery rate correction, like a Bonferroni correction or a benjamini Hawksberg correction, which we will, which we will uh, discuss, by the way, in the next days. Um, and then once you have your, your uh, conclusion, make sure you validate your conclusion, either using an orthogonal uh, biological assay or analyzing it in a different population. So yeah, that's the long answer to saying you can not really remove false discovery. We can minimize it. Thank you, Doc uh, Brian. From Yes, June, ano? Yes, Junio. The use of term biomarker is somewhat controversial. How different are biomarkers from the perspective of nutrition versus disease? Yeah, first of all, shout out to Yes. Hi, Yes. How are you? Yeah. Um, yes, that's, uh, yeah, th that's true. Um, I, I do not have a direct answer to that. Uh, of course, in the nutritional field, we have definitions of biomarkers and, and in one of my slides, and by the way, tomorrow we have a, an in-depth discussion of dietary biomarkers. Um, so yeah, on the nutrition of, uh, in, in the perspective of nutrition and disease, of course, when we say nutritional biomarkers, these are usually the exposure biomarkers. So what have you been eating or what have you been smoking, for example? Uh, in terms of disease biomarkers, it can either be an exposome, so which means also what you've been exposed to, but it, it can also be an intrinsic biomarker. So biomarkers that you have already, but are increased strangely or, or you know, and, um, it's not normal for you to have these high levels of amino acids, for example. Um, so yeah, the, the term biomarker is very loosely used here. But uh, yeah, for, for nutrition and disease, of course, we have different criteria, which you will listen, uh, you will hear tomorrow from Lars. So we can do that or we can do that. Thank you, uh, Ms. Yas, for that question. From Meryl B., is it possible to use nutritional metabolomic study to determine the effect of a very specific diet, even across cultures? Of okay. course. And, and yes, yes. And, and they've been doing that already. So, yeah, I, I don't know if you've heard about this. <clears throat> I don't want to call it fad, but it's a trend. Yeah, this Mediterranean diet, you know, when you have high olive oil and... and and, and nuts. And you know, when I first saw this diet, the only thing I could think of was like, how much is olive oil in the Philippines? For sure, it's very expensive. But um, yes, yeah, so th they've been testing out different specific types of diets and yeah, trying it in different cultures and see the effect. And as I said, we can do some sort of metabotyping whereby we see which uh, which, which groups of people or, or which, which cultures respond to a certain type of dietary intervention. Um, and in fact, that's, uh, th that's one of the key research that we do here at Wageningen University, um, where we test different 
specific diets for different people and see who responds to these diets. So that's a very good application of metabolomics indeed. Thank you. Another question from uh, one of the audience in, <clears throat> uh, in YouTube from Dr. Sophia Amara. Kindly give a brief description of how food metabolomics can be used in nutritional metabolomics. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So tomorrow, uh, I think the focus is also on food metabolomics. Also, the on I think on Friday, it will be more food metabolomics. So food metabolomics or food domics is the analysis of the food itself. Uh, nutritional metabolomics is the an analysis of the response to the food. Um, of course, the response to the food will depend on what is in the food. So th that's how they are very much connected. Uh, for example, a lot of the things we eat that end up in our body are things that we don't produce ourselves, you know, uh, things like essential nutrients. We don't produce that ourselves. So, and, and these essential nutrients, they have, they have bioactive properties. So, so they're all connected, of course, what you put in, um, in your diet affects your own metabolome. And so knowing what is in the food also influences the, the response to the food. So I think that's how they are connected. Okay. Thank you, Doc. Another question from Roxanne Sabesahe. How to describe metabolites presented in the heat map? Um, <clears throat> I will not answer that question now. We will answer that question, I think, on next week or towards the end of this week, where we will do, uh, yeah, I, I think on Thursday. Yeah, I think on Thursday, I will, I, I will uh, go through the data analysis part. So, yes, we will answer that then. So stay tuned on Thursday. Okay. So, Ms. Roxanne, please attend the, all the <clears throat> webinar lectures starting <throat> tomorrow so that your question will be answered. Uh, I was told that this will be the last question. Apologies for the remaining questions unanswered, but the organizing committee will uh, promise us to answer all the questions. From Marites uh, Cachon, how do we influence the public, especially the medical doctors, to accept the concept of omics, metabolomics, since its reproducibility is an issue in analysis? Uh, I will defer that question to FNRI. Uh, I think, as I said a while ago, it's our job to present the possibility, to present the scientific fact. Um, you know, uh, science communication is an, a different field entirely. And to be honest, I've been working with a lot of doctors and yeah, they, they are very accepting of the technology. Um, and so I think that that's the, that's the reason why we have to work very closely with different stakeholders to make sure everyone understands the potential of this technology. Um, yeah, th that, that's, that's all I can say. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, not, not everyone, you're, you're not everyone's favorite cup of tea. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you again, Dr. Gonzalez, for answering those questions <clears throat> and for the great can I presentation. Just, uh, can, can I just, and I see one question here that I'll just very quickly answer. Okay. So if metabolomics will be applied and used here in the Philippines, will it be widely accessible for everybody so, or for everyone? Um, that is the hope. That is the hope. Um, and I think uh, people from the Philippine Genome Center are here. Uh, Hiyas uh, Junio's lab um, uh, also can do it. And I think there's a lab there are several labs in the Philippines who can do it. And, and it's part of my mission to put them all together. So um, we, could, we could make metabolomics accessible for everybody. So that's, that's the mission. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. It was a pleasure to have you with us uh, today. So this concludes the webinar. Thank you for praying with us so that the electricity won't be cut off. Thank, for, thank you for staying also with us. Huwag po kayong mag-alala, bayad po ang FNRI ng kuryente. <laughs> <And> <laughs> thank you all for attending the first of the nine series of webinar. We hope you have learned and enjoyed the presentation of Dr. Uh, Gonzalez. For the information of everyone, the Omic Sena webinar series is part of our 75th the OST FNRI anniversary countdown. We started the countdown last month 
and come July 1, 2022, we'll be celebrating our 75th anniversary with the theme, DOSC FNRI, kasama niyo sa bawat yugto ng buhay at kabuhayan. So that concludes our webinar for today. Please stay safe and healthy, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. See you see again you, see tomorrow. You tomorrow. Thank you, Dr. Brian. Thank you, Ben. In 2010, DOSD FNRI revolutionized its take on nutrition by incorporating genomics in its researches. Investigating the relationship by chemical, <laughs> clinical, dietary, and health components to the genetic makeup of Filipinos, DOSD FNRI is looking into providing a more personalized approach of achieving optimum nutrition to every Filipino. Through nutritional genomics, we attempt to better understand how a single nucleotide, a single letter, can make a big difference in our way of living. And so, to support this endeavor, DOSD FNRI capitalized on establishing its molecular laboratory known as the Nutritional Genomics or the New Gen Lab. With its thrust of bringing science for the people, the New Gen Lab provides assessment of genes and genetic variants associated with micronutrient deficiencies and diet-related non-communicable diseases. The New Gen Lab is equipped with some of the state-of-the-art equipment in molecular biology, such as the automated nucleic acid extraction machine, bioinformatics, real-time and digital PCR systems,